All right, so here we are again, and it turns out that I feel probably 5% less good today than I did yesterday. I'm still much better than Sunday, but negative progress to a bit. And so as of everything, it's important to remember that progress isn't linear, and sometimes things get a bit worse before they get better. I should be fine next week, but I think it would be not a great idea to come in tomorrow and, um, and infect you all. So let's not do that. Um, instead, tomorrow I'll just stay home and think about your quiz. All right, let's look at the lecture notes. And so we are going to talk about Z3. And let me share the screen. Okay. Good. So I should now be screen sharing. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to view the workings of the SMT solver as a black box, but part of the content of this course is to get you to be able to use the SMT solver. And so SMT solver is a category of software um, and it means satisfiable module series. And one particular solver, a really good one is Z3, which comes from Microsoft. It's open source software and you can look at it and enhance it as well. So before we get to SMT, let's talk about SAT or Boolean satisfiability. And so here's a propositional formula F. And so F has variables, variables A, B, C, D. And for satisfiability, satisfiability says that each Boolean variable can be true or false. And so here we have A and B or C or D. And the question for satisfiability is, is there a satisfying assignment that makes F the formula true? And by inspection, we can see, look, A has to be true. And then you can say B equals true. And that's going to make the, the formula um, satisfiable. So either a formula is satisfiable, as I've said, A equals true, B equals true, or C equals true, or D equals true or it's unsatisfiable. And unsatisfiable means that there is no assignment of variables to, uh, so no assignment of values to variables, which makes it true. And so that's a stat problem. And if you'd asked me about it in the 1990s and be like, well, it's NP-complete, it's hard, we can't, we can't solve it. But now we're in 2023 and it's like, nah, SAT in practice is easy and for Somehow all problems, all problems that we encounter in practice, we can solve SAT. You can still come up with a problem that's hard. Um, if you generate a problem randomly, it's going to be hard, but somehow all problems that, that come up are easy. Okay, so there's not just SAT, but what we're going to talk about here is going to be a satisfiable satisfiability modular theories. And so we've talked about propositional formulas, and so what we're going to say is that a formula is, has a model if there's a truth assignment to Boolean variables. So I said A equals true, B equals true, C don't care, D don't care. But we're going to generalize that, and we're going to talk about first-order formulas. And so you have variables. Variables don't have to be Boolean. They can also be integers, for instance. And then we also have function and predicate symbols. And we'll see what that means, I think, on the next slide. And so then SAT solvers check the satisfiability of propositional formulas and give you an assignment if there is one. SMT solvers um, add on to that by checking satisfiability of formulas in a decidable first order theory, like linear arithmetic, uninterpreted functions, array font theories, or bit vectors. Um, if you want to read more about it, there's optional background reading on SMT. And so there's this paper in communications of ACM, September, 2021. Um, there's also a lot of extra background material on the on the course webpage as well. And so if you want to know more, then, then you can look at that. Okay, so let's look at an example. And um, okay, so I'm going to talk through it which is okay, I guess. Um, if you actually look at the winter 2022 um, lectures, then um, 
Ari had the technology of writing on the screen um, and annotating it with uh, with more stuff. I don't have the technology. I'm using Zoom. If I use Zoom and I try to like write stuff, then the screen goes away. And so I won't do that. So I'll just, I don't know, wave my hands and this is what we have. And if we were in person, then I would be writing this on the board, but we are not. Okay, so here's an SMT formula. And so it has a bunch of stuff. It has, um, okay, so what does it have? It has an inter uninterpreted function symbol F here. Um, and so this is a pure function. So basically what it's saying is that F, F of five is always going to be F of five. And um, so it's never going to be anything else. And then what we're also going to have is we're going to have integer arithmetic. So we have um, B and C. And so this is on um, the theory of integers. And so B is an integer, C is an integer. We can say, look, um, it could be like B equals one and C equals three, B plus two equals C. And so you can say, also, c minus 2 equals b by, you know, elementary school. This is a theory of arrays. So we have read and we have write. And so what this is saying is that we have an array A. And if you write to element B of array A and you write to element 3, then, um, then you later on go and refer to that array and you read from element B, then you're going to get the 3 back. And so then what we're going to do here is going to read the element C minus two of that array. And so what this is saying is that huh, this function at this uh, at this index is not equal to this function at index C minus B plus one. And so we have this SMT formula and we're just going to, um, we're going to, combined Boolean predicates with all sorts of other, other theories. So we have uninterpreted functions, we have integers, and we have arrays. And so the next few slides are going to point out the things that I said just now. So we have arithmetic, and then we have array theory, and then we have an uninterpreted function f. OK. Um, so we can do arithmetic operations, as I alluded to before. And so what we're going, what we're doing here is we have f of c minus b plus 1 here, this thing. And so what we know is we know b plus 2 equals c over here, right? And so if we take c equals b plus 2, and then here we say this c, and we substitute b plus 2 with that, then we have b plus 2 minus b plus 1. OK, so b plus 2 minus b is just 2. So that's two. And you have two plus one is three. So we simplify C minus B plus one to three. So that, that makes the formula simpler. Okay. So then it is also the case that if you have, so we have arrays. And so if you write something to an array and you read at the same index, then you get the thing that you wrote. And so we're going to do that to simplify the read and the write. And so here we have this write of index B. And we have this read from index C minus 2. And in fact, we know that B plus 2 equals C or C minus 2 equals B. And so we're reading and writing to the same place. And there's nothing else that's going on in between. And so we can say that we get the 3. And so we have this formula. And this formula simplifies to B plus 2 equals C. And that's fine. There's a model for that. And f of 3 is not equal to f of 3. And f is an uninterpreted function. And what that means is that it's always going to assign the same value to 3. And so what we have here is no matter what value we assign to f of 3, it's going to be something. It's going to be you know 5 or blah or whatever. And so what we're saying is blah is not equal to blah. And that can never be true, no matter what f is. And so we have this formula now, which we simplified our initial somewhat scary looking formula to. And we can see that this formula is not satisfiable. You just can't do it. No matter what you choose F to be, 
it's going to be unsatisfiable. And so this formula is not a formula that, that can be satisfied. All right, cool. That is an example of SMT reasoning about an SMT formula. We did it kind of in a very ad hoc way, but it turns out that by magic, Z3 can actually read these formulas and reason about them as well. And so we'll see some examples of how Z3 does that. Okay. So here's another example. And so this one has inequalities. And so we have X is greater than or equal to zero and f of x is greater than or equal to zero, and y is greater than or equal to zero, and f of y is greater than or equal to zero, and x is not equal to y. So once again, the question is, can we find a model for this formula? So is there an f, and is there a value for x, and is there a value for y that makes this true? And so we can try, look, let's say, okay, well, what can we do for x? Well, we can say x equals one, and then we can say f of x equals one as well, and we can say, for instance, y equals one, and then f of y is also, I said one, I think. And then we get to x is not equal to y. And it's like, oops, that is not a model. So we can backtrack and we can say, okay, now x is one and y equals two. And then you can assign a value to f of x being one and f of y being two. Um, and that is a model that works. And so this formula is satisfiable. It would be better if I wrote this down somewhere. I guess I can't write on the screen, but I can at least make a terminal window. And I can write in that terminal window. All right, so that's that's an example I've written down for you. All right, good. Okay, so let's continue here. Um, yeah, so here's here's another model, and it turns out that that's a model which which works. Okay, so. <clears throat> I set these formulas and we've been writing them in math notation, which is fine. And math notation is easy for us to understand as humans. It's hard to communicate with computers in math notation. You could use LaTeX, which looks good, but is somewhat of a beast to, to parse. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this format that SMT specifies. And so, <clears throat> It provides a rigorous definition of the syntax and semantics for theories. And so we've seen this before last time, but we didn't talk about it much. And so we're going to use what's called S expressions or list like, um, kind of like XML, but instead of weird brackets, we have just one kind of bracket. It doesn't matter too much. Anyway, there's a very regular syntax for, for these functions. And so the operator is always going to be the first thing. And then after that, we're going to have the arguments of the operator. And so we have, for instance, and x, y, um, and greater than or equal to two times x plus z. And so we can also write that expression in the more usual infix notation. Look, you should know this from like, you know, CS241 or EC351, but let's just do that as well. So and so that's like x equals y and um, two times x less than or equal to z. And if I was, you know, 
better of technology or had better technology, I would write that in a tree. Um, but look, this is not CS241, you, you know this. Okay. And so what we have here is this syntax, and then we have commands to interact with the solver. So we can declare constants or function symbols, and so we'll declare x, y, and f using declare fun. Um, then we can actually have assertions. Um, in this context, an assertion is an extra thing that you want to say is true. Uh, it's kind of like the notion of assertion that we've talked about before, but it's an assertion, it's a logical assertion um, about the model more than a statement about the program state. It's useful in, in terms of being able to add more stuff to the, the model. And then we have a model, or we have a context, and what we want to do is we want to check its satisfiability. And so we can use the command check sat to check the satisfiability of the current context. And we can also print the current model. Um, okay, so you're looking at this, this set of lecture notes. And so here's a link, the link. This link has more SMT lib examples. If you were looking at last year's um, notes, then you'd see some link that doesn't work. But you're looking at this lecture notes, and you're not looking at last year's lecture notes. So, so here we are. Uh, anyway, um, let's look at, well, we, we saw this last time. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think I could show you an example right now, but I think I won't do that because we'll see more examples anyway later. And so just kind of hold on and and it'll be it'll be fine. All right. So their syntax, <clears throat> right? And I think I did want to show this syntax, I guess. So let's let's just do that for fun. <clears throat> and let's talk about the things that, that show up here. Um, okay. Um, there's more examples in the live coding directory of the PDFs directory, but this one is not there. So we'll just do it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare fun x. And so what this means is that we're going to declare a function, which is a constant. And so functions can be constants if they take no parameters. And it takes no parameters. That's what the, the empty brackets say. And it returns time in. So it's just going to be like 5 or 2 or something like that. OK. But we're not saying what it was is. And z3 is free to choose it as it wishes, unless we chose to assert that x is something. And so that's why assertions allow you to, to put more stuff into more constraints into the problem that you're asking Z3 to solve. Okay, so we have X, Y, and Z, and we're gonna assert that two times X is greater than Y and Z, the sum. And then we're gonna declare some uninterpreted functions here. Why do we mean uninterpreted functions? Um, to Z3, they just look like F. And so when it's doing reasoning about it, it is going to treat it as F. And it's not going to, F could actually be, you know, G could be like sum, but it's not going to do any reasoning of that sort. It's just like, OK, there is this G. And I'm going to find some function which does it, but it could be any function. And so that's what it means by uninterpreted. And then it's going to be defined um, point wise. And so now we're saying f of x is less than g of xx, and f of y is greater than uh, g of xx. And we're going to check satisfiability and get the model. And maybe there's no typos here. And we'll run C3 and find out if it works or not. Uh, nope, line 9. That's not quite right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 
Uh, yeah, right. Okay, so here's the solution. And so what do we have? So what we have here is we have a model. It says it's satisfiable, and this is why it's satisfiable. So it's not just, it says, yeah, it's satisfiable. Trust me on it. No, it's like, this is the model. If it says unsatisfiable, then it's harder to provide a witness for that. And so then you're kind of out of luck. And it's like, well, it says it's unsatisfiable, and you just kind of have to believe it. But in this case, uh, well, sometimes there's a notion of an uns unsatisfiable core. But in any case, I don't think we talk about that. It says, this is satisfiable. And if we say Z is 1, X is 2, Y is 3, and then G is the identity function 0. And F is the function where <clears throat> if you give F 3, then it returns 1. Otherwise, it returns minus 1. Um, that's going to satisfy your, your constraints. And so we could check that. So let's check that. So 2 times x is 4. And y plus z is 1 plus 3 is 4. And so 4 is greater than or equal to 4. So that's good. Let's look at the next assertion. So the next assertion says that f of x is less than g of x, x. Oh, no, it's not. It's not the free variable x. It's there's there's nothing that says lambda. Sorry. So this is actually evaluating x at this this spot too. So what we're doing is we're evaluating f of x x is actually two, and f of two is equal to minus one, and then g of two two is zero, and so um, minus one is indeed less than zero. So that's good. Okay. And then similarly, um, we're checking f of y. f of y, and y is 3. And g of x, x of 2, 2. And so f of 3, if we look at this, is 1. And then g of 2, 2 is, because g is a constant function, 0. And then we see that uh, we have um, 1 is greater than 0. OK, also. Great. Good. 2. OK, good. Let's continue with the, the thing. So back to the slideshow. All right, so again, is this formula satisfiable? And we saw yes. Um, so let's continue to this example again. Um, OK, anyway, uh, here's a different formula. We can also see whether it's satisfiable or not. And sure, why not? Let's, let's go through what the different parts of this formula mean. OK. So let's talk, let's let's type it in and and talk through it. Okay, so let's do that. ECF.c3. So declare fun b. So once again, b is a constant. C is a constant. A now is going to be a constant. It's going to be a constant array. So we we are going to not say what A is, but it's going to be some array. And F is going to be a function that takes an int and returns an int. So we have this assertion and says, Again, b plus 2 equals c.
One thing about the S expressions is that you get a lot of brackets. And so here we have a lot of brackets. Uh, I'm using nano, um, but if I used Emacs, then it would, and of course, modern editors will give you matching. And so um, right now we just say get check sap, but we can also put get model in there too. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, let's just show you Emacs, but I guess no one uses Emacs these days. You're gonna use something. But anyway, yeah, you see that it highlights the thing. All right, abcf.c3, it's like a yeah, model is not available. Why is a model not available? Because it's unsatisfiable, right? And so it's like, mm, you can't get a model because there is a model, but you can see it says unsat. So that's kind of consistent with, this is the same example as before, and we can see that it's unsatisfiable. Great, let's continue. Okay, so the next thing that you will do on the assignment, and I was looking at this, I will finalize it um, after I finalize the quiz, but uh, but certainly sometime by next week, is what's on assignment two. And I was looking at assignment two last year and the issue was the lack of TA resources. And I was like, yeah, you should really do that question that I said was optional, but I didn't have enough TA resources last year. This year we have heaps more TA resources. And so I think I will actually make it um, required. Uh, we will see how assignment one goes in terms of the marks first. But I think I was looking at it last year. I'm like, people really should do it. But last year I had 125 students and I had like not enough TAs. And so this year we have enough TAs. And I think I will make the, the question that was optional last year required because it was really a good question that got you using this. Anyway, Python Z3 bindings. And so the idea is, so far I've told you, okay, here's how we generate text files and we feed them to C3 and everything's fine. Um, that works, but especially when you have large problems that you want Z3 to solve, maybe you don't need to generate file all on disk at once. Maybe you just generate it programmatically and you tell Z3, here's the data structure, please reason about the, um, here's the AST for the, the SMT instance, please reason about the AST and, 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 and call it good. And so it is possible to have Python Z3 bindings. And so we can say without having to generate the text and without having to parse it, um, here is the, the instance I want you to solve. All right, so this actually exists. No, this does not quite exist in the, um, in the live coding examples directory. I guess I will actually add it to there. Um, there is a simpler example. Um, maybe I don't need to add it to the directory. Anyway, um, here's some Python code and we can run this Python code and it's going to be, it's gonna call the solver and, um, and things are gonna work great. Um, do I have the Python installed? I probably don't, Python C3 binds. But anyway, Let's just type this and see how it goes. Yes, Debian for the win. Okay, let's look at the... Okay, so we're gonna use Python. So what we're saying here is that we have two ints, B and C. It's going to return a list. And we're going to, yeah, we're going to have B and C represent these integers. And so that's when we said define fun B and um, no parameters and int. And so now we're going to define an array. It's going to be an array of ints. And why should use max? Okay. 
good. It's an array int int. And then we're going to have an uninterpreted function. The difference between an uninterpreted function and an array is that an uninterpreted function is constant and you can't change the uninterpreted function, whereas you can write to the array. Okay. So now we're going to create a solver instance and we can add it. We can, uh, so now we have the things that exist in the solver and now we're going to add constraints to it. And so this is things that basically we assert. And this is magic. This is Python reflective magic. And so what we're going to say here is we're going to put just arbitrary Z3 code here and it's going to work. C, C equals B uh, plus Z3 dot in val of two. And that would be nice in other languages. It's not always the case when we do ASTs, but this is going to say create the, the AST that is saying that c equals b plus 2. And that's the example that we've seen over and over again, right? c equals b plus 2. But you can just write that as constraint here. And so this is one of the constraints that you add to the solver. And it's going to generate the nice AST, and it's going to be wonderful. And so now we're going to create also another expression. We're going to create it piecewise. And so it's going to be another expression. And so now we're going to say f. Uh, we're going to have f. This is the thing where we had f of 3, right? Or f of minus 3, whatever. Uh, and we're going to have the store expression. And then we're going to do the read, which is going to be hidden with the syntax. And it's going to be read on c minus 2. OK. And the right-hand side is f of c minus b plus 1. And so then we're going to add the constraint, LHS is not equal to RHS, and then result equals solver check, and then we can print out the result. We talked about the halting problem, right? And so SAT is 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 decidable. It's NP complete, so it might take a while on arbitrary problems. Um, SMT is not decidable, and so we have satisfiable, we have unsatisfiable, and we also have unknown. Even even if SAT is decidable, it's like, well, it might take too long. And so we we have we reserve the right to have a timeout. All right, let's see if I type this correctly. Yeah, so it's not very exciting. It says it's unsatisfiable. Um but I think if we say F of um minus. Maybe that'll work. My computer crashed. I was like, uh oh, that's bad. That seems to have come back. OK. Um, and that's satisfiable. Uh, we could print the model. Um, I don't know offhand how to get to model. But anyway, that is satisfiable. I think I should quit while I'm ahead and stop this recording here. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. So let's stop this recording here, and then I'll, I'll do it in two takes, and I'll, I'll um, I'll add the other part to it though. But here's some useful Z3 Pi in this functions. Uh, so we've saw and seen int, and then we can have a fresh int, which is a unique constant, and we can generate 
like two or five with int val and true or false with bool val. There's the normal arithmetic functions and predicates that you might expect. <clears throat> you can also have distinct arguments. Um, and so you can say x is not equal to y and y is not equal to z and x is not equal to w. So you have distinct things. You have and or not. And then you can add, check, and model. Um, so I guess I could have printed model. And you can also evaluate in the model what is the value of a certain formula. OK, let's stop this um, part here. And then I'll have two examples, which I'll record separately and not push my luck too much. Zoom has many terrible user interface things. One terrible user interface thing it has is when you hit the record button, then it asks you if you want to record on this computer on the cloud and instead of actually starting to record. And so for the second time today, I started speaking and it's not actually recording to me. Grr. Anyway, here we go with part two. And we are going to look at a bit more about the Z3 Python interface and then two case studies of encoding problems into Z3. Um, the point is that this is a thing that is very relevant to, to program verification. Um, a lot of time, like when you're doing program verification, you're trying to encode some program property in terms of a logical formula. And so if you can encode trick problems in like in English in them, then that gives you some experience about how to encode program properties in them. And so it feels to me like it's encoding some English problem into Z3 is a pretty fair question to put on the quiz. We will find out about that soon. OK, so the, the next few examples actually are in the live coding directory in the PDFs uh, repo on Git. And so you can look at them at your leisure and play with them and, and whatever. So the first one is going to be about the Z3 Python interface. It's going to be investigating Z3 interface.py. And we will look at it um, line by line. Okay, so share screen, share screen, share screen, share screen. All right, so let's look at this. I guess we don't need the whole thing, so here we go. And I have them in the repo, but let's just do them here. As always, now we're going to have two um, ints. And so what we can do um, is we can print x, and we can print x, x's class. Um, Cannot pack, unpack, non iterable every thread. Okay. I don't know, man. That looks correct. Right. Ints. I mistyped it. Typos will get you. Okay. So. Of course. Um, ints instead of int. Here we go. And so here we have x. So you print x and it's like a rith threat. And then you're like, what class is x? And it's like an earth threat. Okay, great. Now let's do more. So I talked about the magic that happens when you do expressions. So now let's say w equals x plus y. And it's like, does that really makes sense? Well, there's some Python magic that makes it make sense. OK. So now we can print w. We can print w's class. We can print the s expression. And we can print the first argument. Right. So all these things are fairly self-explanatory. And if all goes well, we can run it. Good. <clears throat> All right, so we print out the expression, and it gives us an infix notation uh, printout of this, x plus y. And this is of type erythrep again. 
And if you ask for the S expression, then it's like plus X, Y. And if you ask for the first arg, then it's like X. Great. Okay. And finally, we can do another one. And use Excel S expression and U dot R one. And there should be no surprise by this point. Uh, we should know what it's going to give us. And so now we have equals X, Y, and the one-th argument or the second argument is Y. All right, so that's pretty simple. That is the Z3 interface and how things work a bit under the hood. So it's this magic thing where you have X plus Y and it parses it and gives the X expression and creates that at runtime. It's great. Okay, um, looking at these slides, so there is this job shop scheduling example in the slides, which we are not going to talk about, and it's messy. Um, we're just not going to. We're just not going to do it. But basically, there are some constraints and some resources, and so you could express all this in terms of Z three. Um, too many constraints. It's 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 a thing that's really good for expressing um, programmatically. Like, so you have certain numbers of jobs and certain numbers of machines. And so what you want to do is you want to say, okay, um, this is how we set it up with an arbitrary number of jobs and arbitrary number of machines. Generate for me, please, a Z3 thing that has five jobs and three machines, right? And then it's like, bam, and you get the, uh, you get, the Z3 instance, and then you can ask Z3, okay, find me a solution to that, right? But we are not going to do that. Too messy. And it's like, you got this encoding, and it's like, you want to generate that automatically. Uh, we don't want to talk about that by hand. Okay, the thing that we are going to talk about, and the thing that feels to me like a good exam question, although obviously not this one, because now you know how to do this one, is dog, cat, and mouse. And so we have these puzzles. These are logic puzzles. And so um, the puzzle here is spend exactly $100 and buy exactly 100 animals. Um, dogs cost $15, cats cost $1, and mice cost 25 cents each. And you have to buy at least one of each. How many of each should you buy? And so I'm just going to work through the solution. If I could write on the board, then that might be better but I can't because I don't have the technology to do that. Um, maybe I will open a text editor and write the constraints out. That seems to make sense. So let's do that. And then I'm going to magically take the solution and type it into Z3 and you're gonna see how it does a Z3 solution. Okay, so let's do that. Let's work through the encoding. Okay, so we have variables which are going to be ints, d, c, and m. And so we want d to represent the number of dogs, c to represent the number of cats, and m to represent the number of mice. So we're going to say exactly 100 animals. So d plus c plus m equals 100. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, this is linear algebra, right? Um, we want to say d is greater than equal to 1. C is greater than or equal to one, and M is greater than or equal to one. And we're going to say um, pennies. So we're going to say that many pennies. And we're going to say D times 15 plus C times 100 plus M times 25 equals that. And that's basically it, right? So it's not that complicated. Um, without looking at the solution, I can go to infix notation. So we can say assert of, uh, and e we can just say that, right? Um, if we're in Z3 land, um, assert, oh, if we're in Python land, then we can say that, but if we're in Z3 land, then we can't say that. Uh, and I guess it depends on which you want to do. Um, could do either. I don't know. Um, 
let's write in in raw z3 equals um 100 plus plus d c m assert of greater than or equal b1 assert of greater than or equal to c1 assert greater than or equal m1 and then assert of um equals and then times 1500 e and then you want to say plus and then plus times c100 um times m25 And so we can declare fun d int declare fun c int declare fun m int um and then we have assert and then we have assert Check that and get model. All right, is this going to work? I don't know. C3, DCM, not C3. Nope. Line six. Uh, one, two, three, missing a bracket. All right, so there we have it. So it's like if you buy 56 mice, 41 cats, and three dogs, it's going to work. So um, I don't know, BC, um, 3, 15 times 3, 15, uh, 3 times 15 plus 41 times 100 plus 56 times 25. Somehow Zoom just like crashes from time to time where it like freezes and it's like, what's, what's, what's going on? Um, Dogs is three, mice is 56. I guess there's a typo here. 3 times 1,600 plus 41 times 100 plus 56 times 25. And that gives you $100. And three plus 41 plus 56 is 100. So here we have a solution. Another question that we can ask is, is there more than one solution? And one way to do this is by asserting, for instance, that um, um, not equals D3. And so is there a solution with more than, not three dogs? And um, forgot. Bracket. And it's like, nope, 
uh, there is only that one solution, or at least there's only one solution with three dogs. Maybe there's one solution with different number of mice and cats, but there probably isn't. So that's the um, that's the direct Z three solution. Um, I can also type in the um, Python solution. It's pretty similar, but maybe it's a bit nicer. Well, the capital, the plural ints. And so here's an assertion. Infix notation is nicer to type. Okay, so that's constraint one. Okay, so now we just say DCM is 100. Uh, CST, oops. And it's like, well, okay, I can put everything in dogs. That works. Well, no, let's say, first of all, you got to have at least one. Okay, um, okay, so greater than zero. And so it's like, okay, fine, I'm going to add that to the the um to the model. And then uh, it's like, okay, one dog, one cat, ninety eight mice. And then we have constraint two equals spend a hundred dollars. Well, there's multiple typos. But let's fix those. And this is a solution that we saw before. Um, dogs three, mice 51, cats 41. And it's it's cleaner, right? It's in fixed notation and everything's great. Um, if we really wanna check some solution with not three, like some solution that's different, we can say sol.had of or the not equals three, m not equals 56, c not equal to 41, print solve dot check, print solve dot model. It's like, nope, there's no model because it's unsatisfiable as we can see at the top of the screen, right? So there is no solution with um, dogs not equal to three or mice not equal to 51, or cats not equal to 40, 41. All right, that's the first example. Now let's look at the second example. This is a bit tricks example. And so this is more germane to things that we might actually do in this class in some sense, because we're going to reason about integers and some bit tricks. So what we're doing here is we're doing reasoning over a finite domain. And so <clears throat> the statement we say here, show that x is not equal to zero and x logical and x minus one equals zero, if and only if x is a power of two. Okay, so that statement is actually true for all x's power of two. But if you wanna show that, then you remember from like first year, you have to use induction to do that. But there's an easier way to do that if you restrict the domain and you say, look, X is going to be a 32-bit machine integer. And so then all you have to do is check the, well, 4 billion integers. But if X is only the powers of 2, then there's only the 32 powers of 2. And so that's easy. And we can also show that X and Y have different signs if X exclusive or Y is less than 0. Um, 
I think we're not actually going to do that one. We're just going to do the first one. Okay, so let's let's um, write that out. So basically, we we kind of don't really need to understand what's going on. We need to understand some things about it, but we don't need to understand all of it. From C three report star x equals bit back of x thirty two, and so C three supports bit vectors. And now we're going to just encode the thing that I said. And so now we have this expression. Um, it doesn't quite do what we want yet because we don't have the other part of it. But this is saying x is not equal to 0 and x and x minus 1 is equal to 0. And so we're going to prove it over all bit vectors of length 32. All right, so this encodes the thing we want. Um, all right, good. The other part requires a little bit of cleverness. So we're going to say um, exp2 x is a power of 2. So we're going to write all the powers. And this is Python. We're going to write all the powers of 2 here. And so for all the powers of two, so all the powers of two that are in 32-bit range. And so let's do that. Okay, so here's all the powers of two. All right. Um, that's good. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say For some power, OK, so proving a thing is sometimes hard. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask it to show that there's no counterexample in this finite set. And so we're going to say, is there a case where x is a power of 2 um, and it's equal to some p in powers? Um, show that x1 equals x two always in our domain um you only get one uh, model back but we can do a negation trick so we're going to get a solver and we're going to say solve that add of not x1 equals x2 and so we're showing that for all powers of two, this is not true. And okay. And it's saying unsatisfiable. So unsatisfiable in this case tells us the thing that we want to know. Like um, there is no counterexample. Um, and so the thing we wanted to know is true. OK, so that's what I have to say. Hopefully, the recording worked, and I can upload this shortly. Um, yeah, again, as I said, I don't think I'll come in tomorrow. I should just spend more time recovering and thinking about your quiz. And so what that means is that I will see you next Tuesday. And um, I will have, hopefully by then, more on assignment two and the quiz. And we will do a normal lecture next Tuesday and continue from there. All right. Good. See you later.